I have good news for you. God is greater than any situation that you have in your life. He's working when you don't see him working. He's bigger than any problem you're facing. Because Jesus rose again. Death could not keep him down. The devil could not keep him down. He rose again so that we could have overcoming victory in our lives. Before I get into my message, just received a note that Brother Isaac is on his way to the emergency room. If we could just pray for Isaac right now that God would be with him. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you said greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Father, I pray, O oh God, that, Lord, that as we've seen miracles, Lord, over these last eight weeks, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for another miracle right now. I pray, Lord, even as he's on the way to the emergency room right now, Lord, whatever is the problem, whatever is going on in his body, I pray in the name of Jesus that by your stripes we are healed. Father, I pray that you touch him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Father, I pray what the enemy would mean for evil, that, Lord, that you would turn it around and mean it for good. Because, Lord, that you are greater than any situation that is in our life, Lord. Father, I pray that in these next few moments as we open your word, I pray, Lord, that you would confirm your word with signs and wonders. Father, I pray, Lord, that faith would arise in this house, Lord. And, Lord, not because of how good we are, but because of how good you are, Lord. Father, I pray, O oh God, that, Lord, that your grace would be poured out into our lives today, Lord. And that, Lord, that we would just, at the end of this service, Lord, know that, Lord, that you would touch, you would heal, you would minister, you would save, you would deliver, Lord. I come against every false spirit. I come against, Lord, every, uh, every uh, uh, temptation of the enemy to distract. I pray, oh God, that, Lord, that our hearts would be aligned to you, Lord, and that, Lord, that you would speak to us and have your way today. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. I'll get there sometime. I'll, I'll get there. I, I will get there. I promise you I'll get you. But the reality is there are many that are sitting in this room, many that are watching me live this morning, who are battling situations in their life that are overwhelming. There are people who are battling discouragement, depression, thoughts of suicide, not knowing their identity. Uh, and as, uh, as I, I talked in the first service, that, that when, I, when I read and prayed over the connection cards this week, I can't tell you how many are battling situations where they want to give up. They feel like God has forgotten them, that God has deserted them, that they feel that God is not going to heal them, God's not going to provide for them. I want to tell you that I have a good, good God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could even ask or imagine. And it's more than just a pep talk, you know. I, I, I'm not here to give you a pep talk today, but I'm here to challenge you with the power of the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And that, that God's Word, uh, our theme verse, is more than just a nice little pep or slogan. That greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. And we need to begin to believe that. Because too many Christians base their faith on feelings instead of basing it on the word of God. And we say, well, I don't feel it. I'm not concerned how you feel this morning. I'm concerned about what God's word says. And, and when we put our faith in the word, faith without works is dead. And, and when we face these kinds of situations, we realize that we can go to the word of God and, and not live, live, resi, relive or, or, or stay on the power of our feelings. Our faith must be in God's word. Can I have an amen? And, and it's either true or it's not true. Either I believe it or I don't believe it. And I can't make you believe something you don't want to believe. But I'm so glad for rhema knowledge of God's word that God through his spirit will speak to us and he will make something alive in us. And I pray this morning that the switch would turn and we would begin to believe that God is greater in us than he that is in the world. 
I want to read from Isaiah 53, just a prophetic word that was about Jesus. It says, who have believed what he had heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Let me tell you, God wants to reveal himself to you today. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we would look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide, hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he was born our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But then we see the word, but... But negates everything else that was just said. He, in the world, he was despised. In the world, he's rejected. In our culture today, people want to belittle Jesus and put Jesus down. But he was pierced for your transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Friends, when we don't have a right understanding of who God is, we're going to go astray. And there's a lot of people who once sat in ICC and other churches on Staten Island who are now astray. They've walked away from God. They've been discouraged. They've been upset. They're saying, God, I, I, I don't believe it anymore. I want you to know this morning that there is a Jesus who wants to touch you where you're at today. He says, all like sheep have have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In our overwhelming situations, I pray that this morning we would be overwhelmed by the grace, the grace of God. We'll be overwhelmed by the mercy of God like the rain as we sang in that one song, that the rains of mercy would come down and that no matter what the enemy's been whispering to you, no matter what you've been feeling, no matter what you've been thinking, that God's grace, amazing grace, would flow into your life today because God is greater than your situation today. In Matthew chapter 8, we see that Jesus is greater than any situation. In the first four verses, we see him healing a leper. In verses 5 through 13, we see the healing of a centurion servant. Isn't it interesting that these healings weren't for church people? They were for people who were lost, people who were outcast, people who were deserted by society. And Jesus is still going after, not the righteous, he's going after the sinner. Can I have an Amen. In verses 14 through 17, we see the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. In verses 28 through 34, we see the deliverance of healing of two demon-possessed men. Let me tell you, there is a real devil who is out to oppress. He's out to possess, but I'm so glad that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I don't care what curse has been put on you by your mama or your papa, but I want to let you know that Jesus hung on an old rugged cross to deliver you from the curse of the law. He's come to set the captive free. He hasn't caused you to be bound by the enemy for the rest of your life. He came to set the captive free. He came to deliver you from oppression, from external things. He's come to deliver you from possession if the dem demonic things are on the inside. And you say, well, I'm a church going. Friends, church going people can be just as possessed as it's not that you're a church person. It's that you've been born again by the Spirit of God. And when greater is he that is in you, when he is in you is greater than the world, then there's no demon in hell that has power over your life. But Jesus must be on the inside. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And when you read about Jesus, there are 36 miracles recorded in the Bible that were performed by Jesus. 27 out of the 36 deal with healing of body, mind, soul, and spirit. Friends, do I really believe that God is greater than my situation? Do you believe the promises of God? We can say, yeah, well, I, I don't know if I really believe it. It says in Matthew 8, 16, he healed all that were sick. In Luke 6, 19, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came from him, and he healed them all. In Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all 
who are oppressed by the enemy. Oppressions from the outside. When the, when the enemy comes trying to pull us down, trying to discourage us, trying to get us defeated, to say there's no way out, there's no hope, you might as well end your life. You might as well commit suicide. Let me tell you this morning, there is a Jesus who has the same power, who delivered people from the oppression of the enemy, for God was with him. And if you're here today and you need God to do something in your life, friends, there is a healing touch that is about to come. Do you need a miracle? In your mind, first of all. I'm not going to the body first. I'm going to the mind first. We need to begin to win the battle in our thought life. We need to win the battle in our minds. Friends, some of us have stinking thinking and our stinking thinking need to be safe thinking instead of stinking thinking. We need to change the way we see things, the way we feel about things. Many of you may be in this room. Maybe you're watching me live this morning and you need a healing from your past. Your past is always right there before you. The past, the mistakes, the garbage, the messes it is coming against you. You're bound to your past. You're wracked with guilt. You're wracked with shame. You're wracked and say, man, if I only did something different and the enemy comes in like a flood and God wants to do something. He wants to touch your thought today. He wants to touch your mind. Friends, what are we going to allow to control our thoughts will determine our destiny. How we think determines our destiny. If I think, well, God's not going to work, God's not going to work. I need to begin to believe that God, all things are possible to him who believes. I need to begin to believe that God, I'm standing on your word. I may not feel anything changing right now, but Lord, I stand on your word. I stand on the promises of God. It says in Proverbs 4.23 in, in the Good News Testament, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. You say, well, how come God doesn't work with me? Maybe because our thought life isn't where God wants it to be. How many of us are thinking, well, God can't do it today. Or God's not going to do it for me. Or God can't save my marriage. Or God can't heal me. Or God can't provide for me. The reality is I need to allow the Lord to help to control my thoughts and my mind because my thoughts control the destiny of my life. The reality is is I need to manage my thoughts because my mind is the battleground for the enemy. My mind is the battleground for sin. My mind is the battleground for temptation. And I need to take captive every thought, every thought. I need to take captive those thoughts at the midnight hour. I need to take captive those thoughts on a Saturday night when I'm all alone doing what I'm not supposed to do. Friends, I need to take captive every thought and bring it under obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to say, Lord, I need you to touch my thinking. I need you to touch my mind so that I think the way you want me to think. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned. But there's something else deep within me. In my lower nature that is at war with my mind and wins the fight. Whoever wins the fight of the mind makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant. But instead, I find myself still enslaved to sin. Oh, you can come to church. You can sing hallelujah. You can sing amazing grace all you want. But until I begin to change the way I think and the way I think and the way I I process things, that I'm still enslaved to sin. Let me tell you, when Jesus comes on the inside, you are no longer a slave to any sin. You are no longer a slave to any devil. You are no longer a slave to your past. He that the Son is set free is free indeed. I don't need a hundred lessons of how to get free. I just need to say, Lord, I welcome your Holy Spirit into my life. I welcome the touch of Jesus upon my mind, upon my spirit. I I invite you in. I'm tired of being a servant of slim, enslaved to sin. My thought life is the thing that Satan's going to attack. But the reality is, is when greater is he that is in you is on the inside, there is peace. There is joy. 
There is victory. There's not defeat. There's not depression. There's not those things that will defeat me. But joy comes in the morning. Can I have an amen? It says in Romans 8, 6, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And friends, we need a mind transformation. We need a miracle in the way we think and the way we see things. Jesus is still the healer of our minds. Maybe you're in this room, you need a healing in your emotions. How many people are an emotional basket case? They're so emotionally messed. They're full of anger. They're full of unforgiveness, bitterness, anxiety, worry, fear. We're unable to love God. We're unable to love our husband, our wife. We're unable to love our children, love our parents. We're so full of emotion mess. Now, let me tell you, God wants to touch your mess this morning. Can I have an amen? He wants to step in. He wants to change your mind. He wants to change your emotion. There is a Jesus that is greater than any emotion issue that you carry it. Oh, he wants to touch your soul. He wants to touch your spirit. The greatest healing is not the healing of cancer. Oh, someone called me this week and said two weeks ago they were diagnosed with stage one lung cancer. They went through all tests last week and when they came out on Friday, the doctor says there's no cancer. We can't find any cancer. And we say, oh, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God for healings that are happening. But let me tell you, the greatest healing is not the healing of cancer. Because you can be healed of cancer and die in your sin and go to heaven, go to hell. But first, the greatest healing is when God heals a soul, when God heals our spirits, when, when God makes us right with him. Friends, the greatest healing is not the physical, but a spiritual healing. The greatest healing is when someone gives their lives to Jesus Christ, and, and you may be here today, and you've come for a miracle in your physical body. I pray that God, God will do that. But then more than the physical, more than the financial, more than the car and the home and the blessing, that God would save souls today, that he would save our unsaved loved one, you may be here today and consider yourself a Christian. You consider yourself a Christian. I come to church. I look like a Christian. I talk like a Christian. But friends, if Jesus isn't on the inside, you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian if you're still bound by sin. You're not a Christian if you're still battling addictions and can't move forward. You've been stuck in this place for the last 30 years. It's time to say, Lord, he that the Son set free is free indeed. That I'm no longer an addict, but now I'm free in Jesus' name. Oh, you call yourself a Christian, but you're still battling bondages that are keeping you from God's greater thing. Friends, God came to set you free. Maybe you're in this room, you're battling eating disorder, gender issues, addiction. Maybe you're, you're addicted to pain medication, and the list can go on and on and on and on and on. Friends, let me tell you, God loves you, but God came to set you free today. I have good news. You don't have to live that way anymore because of the power of the good news of Jesus Christ and he's the healer, not only of my mind, not only of my spirit, but of my soul as well. And then he is the healer of our body. Oh, thank God he can heal. Friends, we whisper to ourselves, well, why would Jesus heal me? Why would Jesus deliver me? Why would Jesus provide for me? Friends, we begin to believe that Jesus doesn't heal. But friends, Jesus doesn't base on how good I am. He, based, he heals, he ministers because of how good he is. Not because of how, how righteous I think I am because all my righteousness is as filthy rag. I don't care how long I've been saved. I've been saved for 50 something years. It doesn't make me righteous. I'm still a sinner who needs Jesus Christ day by day in my life to cleanse and to forgive, he heals, he saves, he sanctifies based on who he is and his character. And you may feel unworthy today and we're all unworthy, but listen to what Matthew chapter nine says in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and praying, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers, the laborers, the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. I want to say something. God is still a God of compassion today. 
He looks at America. Many Christians are so upset and agitated with what's going on in our world, and it's enough to get anybody upset. But friends, I have a God in heaven that's not looking down from heaven saying, I can't stand those people. You know, those people, they're so, they're so far away from God, and, and, and I hate them. No, God loves them. God loves them, and the church should love them as well. Can I have an Amen. He, lo- he loves people in their sin. He's not looking down with anger. He's not looking down with frustration. He's not looking down with hatred. He sees the sin. He sees the pain. He sees the sorrow. He sees the addiction. He sees the ones that are so bound up in, in all the issues of our day. And he has compassion for them. He, what he is saying, it, the, the church is all about rules. But Jesus said, I have a better way for you. I have a better way for you. I provided a better way for you. You don't need to commit suicide. You don't need to bind into the drugs. You don't need to go that way. I have a better way for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father unless he comes to the Son. God sees what's going on in your marriage. He looks with compassion. He looks what's going on with your children. He looks with compassion. He looks at people and he sees that they're harassed. That word harassed means the feeling or looking strained through having too many demands made on a person. Friends, we are harassed people in this world today. That word means stressed. It means strained. It means frayed where you're falling apart. It means worn out. It means hard pressed. It means worried. It means agitated. It means troubled. It means in distraught. It means that you're at the end of your rope and you're ready to give in. Friends, that describes our nature in our world today. We are harassed on every side. We're worn out by so many things. We're battling depression and thoughts of suicide. And I'm talking about in the church. We're talking about cutting and hopelessness and gender issues because we don't realize that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Friends, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Friends, we're just clay. We're nothing special, we're just clay. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassing power belongs to God. Belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way. We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. Why am I not crushed? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If he's not in there, I'm crushed. I'm like a soda can that I step on when it's empty. It's going to be crushed and thrown into into the garbage bin. But I'm so glad that even though I am afflicted by every way, I am not crushed. I am perplexed. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how what's going on. I'm perplexed, but I'm not driven to despair because I know the one who sits on the throne of heaven today and he's looking down with love and compassion. I may be persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I may be struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I'm always carrying in me the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. You may be harassed today, but there's a healer in the house today that can touch you. You may be helpless, no matter how put together you look like. How smart you think you may be. How great we think we are. We're helpless. I can't fix myself. I can't fix the mess of my life. I can't save myself. I can't deliver myself. I can't go to enough AA meetings. I can't go to enough group seminars. I can't go to enough counseling appointments. I, I, I can't go to enough doctors. I can't go to the gym enough. I can't fix my mess, but I'm so glad today that there is a helper. He says, I will send the helper. I will send the comforter. I will send the paraclete. We are helpless, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And there's an old song we used to sing. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul, something happened. And now I know he touched me. He touched me. He touched me and made me whole. We need the touch of Jesus today. Now I'm going to start preaching. Matthew chapter 8. That was just my introduction. Don't get upset. (laughs) 
That was just to get our minds thinking in the right way. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. I won't be long, I promise. I have another service. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and what? Touched him. Touched him. He touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Friends, let me give you a little background on what's going on. Jesus has been up praying with the Father. Friends, he couldn't be with the people all the time. People are draining. Can I have an amen? And and, and so Jesus had to get away from the crowds. He had to go up and pray to his Father. Uh, Because, and, and the problem was he had to be connected to the Father to have the power of the Spirit in his life. Friends, too many of us haven't been connected to the Father. And we wonder why God isn't doing that greater things. How many of you have an iPhone? You would not dare allow your iPhone to go below 20%. Some won't let it go below 80. Oh, You know, you let your iPhone go down to 5%. Then you're in a car accident and you need to call somebody. Oh, I have no power. I have no juice. I can't make a call. Plug the phone in. Get the charge. In the spiritual sense, we need to plug in to the Father. Don't let it go down to 20%, 10%, 5%. Because when the trial and the sorrow and the tragedies of life come, you have no power to call out to God. You stay filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the tragedies come, you have a power source that is able to get you through it. Friends, it's in the spiritual life, we become spiritually apathetic. We become spiritually disconnected. He comes down from the Father and people are waiting for Jesus and the crowds are waiting they're just waiting why because they know they've been he's been with Jesus friends people will know if you've been with God or not you just get around talking to some Christians you know they haven't been with Jesus in about 25 years you know somebody that's been with Jesus because Jesus flows out of them the word flows out of them you, 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 the social media flows out of, out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks and, and the crowd is waiting. And in that crowd, there were religious leaders and Pharisees and, and, and they just came to find something wrong. There's people in this service. You come, find what's wrong. Well, Nicole's accent wasn't too good. Oh, the musicians messed up. Oh, they missed me that someone didn't shake my hands. And friends, too many Pharisees and religious people only come to church to find out what's wrong. Let me tell you, there were other people in the crowd. There were only people that came to the crowd to get a miracle from Jesus. All they wanted was a miracle. All, they didn't care about Jesus. All they wanted Jesus was to do to heal them, to touch them, to bless them. Oh, to give me the car, to give me the husband, give me the wife. And then we get it, we get it and then we say, God, please take it away. Yeah, you know, and all we want is Jesus to do something. But then there were others in the crowd who wanted to follow Jesus. They wanted to give their lives to Jesus. And, and so just like in, in that crowd, just like in every service, in, uh, in every church, there are all kinds of three people. And, and, and that's what's going on. And so in Matthew 8, verse 2, And behold, the leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Well, we read that, and we just sweep over that. that well, it's just like a cold. It's not a big deal. But lepers in Bible days, it was the most hideous disease that was ever known. If a person was a leper, he was unclean. He was a social outcast. It was a dreaded disease. And if you read in the Old Testament, they were not able to comb their hair. They had to wear a mask whenever they went out in public. 
Wherever they went, they would have to shout, oh, I'm clean, I'm clean, I'm clean. If, if they were in public, they were scorned and they were shunned by people. E.W. Masterman said, no other disease reduces a human being for so many years to such a hideous wreck. Uh, and what does leprosy do? It starts as a small ulcer on the body. Not a big deal. But then that, lepro- that, that, that leprosy begins to grow. It begins to take over its body. It begins to make you numb so you don't feel things. There's a lot of Christians who no longer feel things. And then all of a sudden, the ulcers are breaking out all over your body. The ulcers begin to eat away at your fingers and your toes. And if, and if a long, 19 years, it could go on. And what would happen? The hands and the feet would begin to fall off. They would have a foul smell that would come out of those ulcers and and it would be a stench and you wouldn't want to be near. In fact, you'd have to be 100 feet down. If you were a leper, you had to stay 100 feet away from every person. You could not go to church. You could not be around other people. And and friends, can you imagine what this leper must have felt, the physical pain? Uh, You know, we we get a splinter in our finger and we're crying out for dear Jesus to come and deliver us. This, this poor leper, he's losing his fingers, he's losing his toes, he's losing his head. Can you imagine just the physical pain? Uh, you, you think of Job in the book of Job, and, and he's sitting on an ash heap, and, and we don't know what it was, but he's scraping, his, he's scraping the sores with broken pieces of pottery. He just wanted the agony. This is what this leper was feeling. Can you imagine the emotional pain this, this leper must have felt? And nobody talks to him. Nobody wants to be around him. He couldn't be at church. He couldn't Going. He was isolated. He was lonely. Can you imagine the treatment that lepers would receive? They, they were, in fact, dead. They were outcasts. Can you imagine the ridicule that nobody wanted to be around them? Can you imagine they were the butt end of jokes and steers and rejection and hatred? And if a person was a leper, the priest would come and read last rites from a distance when he first is diagnosed. He was barred. All lepers were barred from Jerusalem. If they were not able to put their head into a house or the house would be unclean. It was illegal to talk to a leper in Bible days. Friends, rabbis boasted about throwing stones at lepers to keep them away. And that's what this leper was. This leper thanks God for the history lesson, Pastor. But what am I saying? I want to say it very quickly and very succinctly. Every one of us is a spiritual leper. You say, what's the difference between leprosy and sin? None. I want want to point out how leprosy and sin is exactly alike because we're all sick. We're all wicked. Sometimes we walk around like, hey, I'm no longer a sinner. Isaiah wrote to the church, to the people in Isaiah 1, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of your foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Friends, we need the oil, the oil of the Holy Spirit. Can I have an amen? Friends, what sin is deeper than just the skin. The leper, they saw the ulcers, and, but friends, the, the disease started a long time before that. Friends, sin is not a surfacing. Well, I just talk this way or I just act this way. Sin is a condition of the heart. And God looks at your heart. He doesn't, he, he doesn't look at just the attitudes or the action. He looks at the heart. His word says the heart is wicked above all things. The heart is wicked above all things. Friends, sin spreads like leprosy. Can I say it? That sin starts small and like the leprosy, it can go for 19, 20 years before the hands and the feet begin falling off. But friends, it started many, many years before that. And friends, sin will not stay private or hidden. If, if I pray that your sin will catch up to you. Can I have an amen? Be sure your sins will find you you out. Friends, let me tell you, that's not bad news. That means God's not against you, that God is so much for you, that he loves you. He wants you to come back to him. He wants to have connection with you. A sin will defile and isolate us, just like leprosy, just like the leper would say unclean and unclean. Friends, sin does the same thing. It defiles us. See, today people come in and say, hey, I'm living this way and you need to take me in as a member. Let me tell you, if you're not born again by the Spirit of God, you don't have a right to be a member in the church. 
Oh, you can come. God loves you. But friends, sin defiles. Sin isolates us. Can I have an amen? Amen. Sin will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. Sin will separate us from people. You ask the couple that adultery has happened in their relationship, and all of a sudden there is a separation between that husband and wife. They may even say, Lord, forgive me, but that separation, sin will separate families and children. Sin will always separate us from the church. Sin will always separate us from God. Friends, no one may know it on the outside, but friends, you know if you're connected to God, if you're not connected, to God. It doesn't matter what you look like. Jesus is the only one that can forgive us and touch us. He's the only one that can forgive our sin. He's the only one that can heal our sickness. He's the only one that can deliver us. And Lord, if you are willing, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Who is this leper? Let me give you some lessons in closing. What I learned from this leper, three lessons real quick. Number one, this leper came to Jesus in this mess, in the condition that he was. He came to him with confidence, not with cockiness. He came with confidence, not cockiness. The leper came to Jesus and said, if you are willing, make me clean. This leper came. He hasn't been in church for years. He is such a mess. He's so broken. He's so isolated. He, He is such a wreck but he believed that Jesus could touch him. Even in the impossible situation, the reality is no leper would go to the priest or the rabbi. He would not go to the church. He would not go to the preacher because they would throw stones at him and say, you're not welcomed here. I want to say something, time out. I pray every, every, every unsafe sinner on Staten Island will feel at home when they walk into these doors. I don't care what they look like. I don't care how messed up they are. I don't care where they've come from. I don't care if they wear a hat. I don't care if they have tattoos. I don't care if they have ear piercings. I don't care where they come. They're somebody's child. They're somebody's husband. They're somebody's wife. And friends, the church needs to be like Jesus. Jesus didn't throw that leper out. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me whole. I pray that we would have that kind of faith in Jesus, that we would have a confidence. He came to Jesus just as he was. He came in his mess. He came in his sickness. He came in his struggle. How many people feel, I need to get my life together before I can come to Jesus? Friends, let me tell you, Jesus says, you come just the way as you are. If you're bound in drugs, you come with your drug. If you're an alcoholic, you come with your boot. If you come, and I will cleanse you. I will set you free. If you've been involved in the account, you come the way that you are, and Jesus will change you. He will set you free. You come in your pornography. He will set you free. Friends, Jesus is willing if we will come to him. You will never be able to clean yourself. That's a wasted effort. Well, I'm going to clean myself up. Oh, I grew up in a home every Saturday night with Saturday night baths. Had baked beans and hot dogs every Saturday night of my life growing up. Mom, if you're watching me, I love you. (laughs) Hot dogs and beans, Lawrence Welk and a bath. You have to be clean to go to church on Sunday. You don't want people smelling you. How many people do a Saturday night ritual? Oh, I get cleaned all up so I can go to church. Let me tell you, God says you come just the way you are. You come the mess that you are. You come with your problems, your flaws, your imperfections. Jesus says, come to me just as you are. The leper had faith to believe that Jesus would heal him. If Jesus can touch this leper, if Jesus can touch this outcast, if Jesus can touch this dying man, then he can touch you and he can touch me. Friends, Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith in Mark 5, 34. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. In Mark 10, 52, God said, go said, Jesus, your faith has healed you. In James 1, verses 6 and 7, but when he asked, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he should receive anything from the Lord. Lord, help me to come in confidence like this leper. Not how good I am, but Lord, how good you are. And no matter what you're like today, just like this leper, we need to come to Jesus with confidence. But secondly, The leper came to Jesus with humility. 
As Andrew comes, the Lord, the leper said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This leper didn't come demanding a healing. Oh, we have a lot of that blab it and grab it stuff today. Oh, 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 God, you owe me. God owes me absolutely nothing. I'm not here to tell God what to do. I'm not here to tell God, hey, God, I've been serving you for 38 years. Uh, and God, that, I, that you owe me something. Lord, you owe me something. Hey, I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. You owe me something. God owes me absolutely nothing. He owes me absolutely nothing. I can't claim a healing because I'm deserving. Friends, today in the church, there are a lot of places where we think we have rights. I want to say we have no rights. Friends, the leper came humbly and said, Lord, if you are willing. He was really saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. And Lord, your will be done. And Lord, I, I, I need a healing. But Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Hey Lord, you want me to get married? Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Hey Lord, if you want my kids to be saved, he wants them to be saved. Can I have an amen? I must come by faith because I don't deserve a touch from the Lord. I'm a leper and can only come on the grace and the mercy of Jesus. But I come in faith and I ask for your touch today. Humility says, Lord, I'm desperate. Desperate. I'm desperate for your touch in my life. I'm desperate, it says in James 4, but he gives more grace. Oh, we want the answer. God says, I want to give you grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace. It doesn't say he gives you the lottery numbers. Doesn't say he give you the miracle, the, oh, the, oh, that mansion on a hilltop down here. He says he resists, he gives grace to the humble. He opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. That connection to God. Draw near to God and God will draw near to you. Hey God, if you want to do it, you do it. No, I need to come like this leper. Can you imagine if he had no feet, how he got to God, but he came to Jesus. He said, I'm coming to Jesus. I'm coming just the way that I am. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Friends, that's talking about repentance. Friends, when I come to God, it's not my will, but his will. I come with confidence. I come with humility. But one last thing, the leper came to Jesus in reverence and worship. The authorized version says it this way. He came to Jesus and worshiped him. Some of us can't worship God because we're so caught up in the situation. This guy, can you imagine him lifting his hands? He had no hands. He lifted his stubs to the Lord began to worship him. He couldn't stand on two feet. He, he was a leper. The leper knew that he was in the presence of God. And, and when you come into the presence of God, friends, it's all about worship. When I come with confidence, I can boldly come into the throne room of grace to find mercy and help in the time of need. He came with humility saying, God, here I am. I need your touch today. And he began to worship God. I wonder if we don't see greater things in the church today because we don't worship him in spirit and in truth. Oh, you may sing the songs if you like the songs. Oh, you may say, oh, oh I like the dance. I like, oh, I like all what goes on. But God is saying, I want you to worship me on your good day and I want you to worship me on your bad day. I want you to worship me when you're healed, when the miracle takes place, and I want you to worship me when the miracle is not there. I've had a blood disease since I was 39 years old. I'm 59. For 20 years, I've suffered with a blood disease. I, I've prayed. I've, I've come with confidence. I, I, I've come with humility. 
but I'm going to worship God because one day I may be healed now or I may be healed there, but I'm going to worship him. I'm going to worship him because worship changes the atmosphere. Worship changes me. Worship brings me into that place. Friends, what do we do in the presence of God? Do we even recognize his presence anymore? Friends, do we even recognize the presence of God? Oh, we had the presence of God here this morning and some of us didn't feel a thing. Oh, God, help us to know your presence. How did Jesus respond to this leper? He responded with compassion. He touched the leper. He touched the leper. Men in the church said, hey, we would have to get the mask, the gloves, the gown, the little booties. Then, oh, then maybe I'll pray. Jesus saw this leper. Nobody else would touch him. When was the last time somebody touched that man? But Jesus, in compassion, went and touched the leper. Jesus is here to touch somebody today. Say, if you only knew my mess, if you only knew what's going on, he wouldn't touch me. He's a God of compassion. He's willing to touch the lepers. He's willing to touch us with compassion. He is the Messiah. Can I have an amen? amen? Oh, Jesus didn't get all upset. He didn't run from the leper. I want to say Jesus is not intimidated by your sin. He's not intimidated or fearful of your secrets. If you told some Christians what you, how you're really living, if you told some Christians about your perversion, your bondages, your addictions, they would write you off and say you're not welcomed anymore. But Jesus shows me here. He touched the leper. Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Oh, he responded with help. Jesus helped this man. It says in verse 3, and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. You know what people need to know today? That Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Don't you listen to the lies of the enemy that says I'm no good, I'm not worth it. It says in verse three, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. As we stand all over this place today,